Fernando, thanks to be here with us. You have done a tremendous amount of work on uh, what you call the informal sector. You don't talk about poor people. You say actually what they do is they do entrepreneurship and what they are lacking is not capital or talent, but what they are lacking is legal representations of their assets. And if we could do that, then they would be successful. That's pretty much it. And it's not the result of uh, so much thinking about it, but of observing people. Most people in developing countries um, organize their assets together and therefore are entrepreneurs. It's rare to see something done by one person. Everything is done by multiple persons. The advantage of the law is that it allows you to form a company to bring yourself together. It's not like having a family together. It's like a production unit. And property allows you to represent your goods in a manner that can be read and reflected. So it's a lack of representation of their assets. Why is that so important? We would think of whether they are legally represented or not. It doesn't matter. It's about the ideas and the produce that they offer. You say no. It's uh, it's about uh, to sh to represent to to. Better you express it. Well, yes, of course. I mean, if I go to my hotel and I'm asked to identify myself, it's not enough enough that I say I am me. I will have to come out with some identity piece. If I say I can pay the hotel, I will have to come with a credit card, which is verified, that can be tested for truth. I mean, even if you look at this glass of water that you have kindly offered me, there's nothing on the glass of water that says who it belongs to. It is always a document that tells you what the glass is about. We live in two levels of reality, the physical thing and the things we use to explain physical things. So without this representation, there is no credit, there is no credibility, that's what I learned from you, and that's important in business. And there is no, and there is no capital, and there is no identity. You are basically represented by everything, then if you are selling tea, and it's 100 grams, and it doesn't say 100 grams, it's not 100 grams. Everything is basically semiotical. Everything we human beings do between each other has a level of representation, a level of explanation. And there's no possibility of having a large market without standards, and that necessarily means representation. For Westerners like us, it's quite self-evident that every business is, has a legal base. But in developing countries, it's not, uh, not the normal way. It is not, but it was also not the normal way for you Europeans. Into the 19th century, if you wanted to have a company or a corporation, you needed an authorization from the king. It was called the Charter of the King. In the United States, you needed an uh, Act of Congress to be a company. It's only since about 150 years to 120 years that every time you want to form a company, you just simply register it. It's a very recent ex ex uh, invention and uh, universally available, but we've already gotten used to it. And we forget that maybe five to four billion people in the world don't have it. And that's why we don't realize that they have enterprise and that the reason they're poor is because they can't be recognized. There's something uh going on uh, quite exciting now in the Arab world with what is called Arab Spring. You connect it to this idea of legal representation of business. How do you connect that? Well, the first thing was actually relatively easy, though we've actually done a lot of research on it and visited most of the Middle Eastern and North African countries. You will remember that the Arab Spring starts in all of these countries that are very culturally different. But it begins with a street vendor called the Tarek Mohammed Bouazizi in the city of Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia, who self-immolates himself, he lights up, in protest. Now, they do this a lot of times, but this time, millions of people walk into the street. And before 50 days are over, uh, four heads of state are coming down, and uh, millions of people go into the streets, and that's because 32 entrepreneurs, excuse me, 37 entrepreneurs actually self-immolate themselves because the assets they held, which were held illegally or without paper, were taken away by authorities. 
So what they're basically is what they're basically doing is revolting against the lack of property rights. So their assets were taken away, some food uh, chests. That's right. And that defeated their economic existence, and that's why they stood up and. That's correct. It uh, it always looks like as if they were just a street vendor and his food was taken away. But it wasn't only the food that was taken away. It was his right to sell in a specific spot. That's his property right. It was his right to eventually get a title to his home so that on the basis of that he could get a mortgage and with the mortgage be able to finance a truck that actually got him closer to the market. It was his right to be identified and receive justice. In the case of Egypt, it was somebody that was not in fruit, it was into computers. In, the, in other cases, it's been somebody who actually published a certain amount of books. So, but they were all one characteristic. They were all entrepreneurs and they were all illegal. We may be saying too much in terms of uh, democracy or a political upheaval, but you say basically it was an upheaval done by entrepreneurs. Well, you know, revolutions get stolen. And uh, I'm not saying that we now know all the truths. What I'm saying is that, possibly given my bias, when uh, we see that the people who did the burning, not the people who did the organizing or the people who did the communications, but the people who sacrificed their lives were not people with political ideologies. They were people who only had as a source of income uh, a, uh, a business And what was interesting is not only that they burnt themselves, but the people came out on the streets from Morocco, through Egypt, to Libya, to Syria, where you have tribes and where you have cities. Everyone across seemed to communicate. And that's because our interpretation is that about 60% of all Arab countries are illegal entrepreneurs. Yeah. And they could uh, easily self-identify themselves with that person who sacrificed himself because they said it's the same situation that we are in every day. They got connected. They must have been connected. If they had been military that had been doing the burning, you could have said it's the military. If they had been intellectuals, you can understand that it's the French Revolution again. But these were entrepreneurs. The first one of them was Zizi, who as a matter of fact, when I asked his brother, why was it that uh, Mohammed was Zizi burnt? what would he say if he could come down today? His message was rather unromantic in European terms. It was, he would say today that even the poor have the right to buy and sell. That's what it was about. So your advice would be give them legal rights, legalize what they do, uh, legalize their economic life, and that would be a big progress. I would say so. Uh, the first thing, of course, is uh, to leave it up to anybody's interpretation. But the fact is, count them. They're businessmen. Count them. They're illegal. Count them. They were protesting expropriation or confiscation, whatever you, whatever you want to call, call it. And they are the people that moved anything. And if you're a politician, you should put your eye on that. Because uh, as a politician, you have uh, the obligation to interpret things correctly. And if you don't, somebody else will come later on and interpret things correctly. So the idea is to put the economics into the agenda. And so far, I have not seen one article against the kind of things we've been saying and it's been published elsewhere. So it's the Industrial Revolution. Plus, you know, we keep on forgetting that the bis businessmen started off 700 years ago. There was a time 700 years ago that you could draw a check in uh, Lebanon, in Beirut, and, and uh, collect it in Shanghai. So they've been there for a long time. It's, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, the bazaar and the souk have spread to the rest of the population. Most of the media report the Arab Spring as something unemployed people Uh, uprising and you say they are not unemployed they for us they look unemployed because they have no employment with a big company or with government but in fact they are entrepreneurs small entrepreneurs but they are entrepreneurs well this is right uh, the fact is if you're unemployed and you're poor you die because you start there is nothing like unemployment you have to do something to survive that's right if you're still alive Uh, you obviously are doing something and you are gaining income. 
So yes, they're not unemployed, yet they all belong to the unemployed club. It's because the, the world with, during the ILO has got basically two, two things, employers, the state, and then the employed. So you're either unemployed or you're employed. In fact, there is a, another category, which is the informal economy, which is about those people who have created an enterprise outside the law, but they're not represented. Somebody's going to represent them. Uh, and that's what I think is the challenge of the future. Who is going to represent them is going to depend very much on how and with who they identify. Mm -hmm.